Hi, this is Professor Bauer. Welcome to week eight as we look at the role of reference architecture in EA. Uh, this will be a bit of a roadmap for the module as well as summary of the important information, um, but by no way will it replace the need to uh, read uh, the materials and study. This is also a combined video for bo both the hybrid section and the asynchronous section. So let's jump in. So much to uh, talk about in our eighth week here. Keep in mind there'll be no on-campus meeting for the hybrid section. Our next one will be uh, week 10. That'll be a uh, preparation of the major um, assignment, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the finalization and unification of all part, all five parts of the Arch Insurance uh, case study. And we're going to uh, look at reference architecture, um, just briefly touch on the readings, the assignments, and uh, spend the majority of the rest of our time on the case study part four, which is privacy and governance. Let's jump in. Um, a lot of industries have found it helpful to, perform, to form a, a professional body that develops and supports reference architectures, patterns, roles, activities that are similar that evolve into industry standards. These benefit industries as they can make similar components. They benefit users as you don't have to buy 16 different types of USB um, interfaces and connectors and things like that, speeds and feeds uh, on cable and fiber channel and, um, you know, under underwater trunk lines and things like that uh, become standardized and that actually makes things move faster. And we'll talk about that and how they can be useful to ICT professionals, particularly in enterprise architecture. When is something evolving? When does it become a standard? When is the inevitable innovation coming that will change, perhaps even revolutionize uh, this particular activity into a brand new evolving standard? And so this is the um, continuous march of change that all businesses and all IT professionals have to address. How do you leverage it for your own? When do you jump in? When is it time to move on? Those sorts of things. We'll talk briefly about them. It's super important. Even if you never become an IT architect, um, just understanding how technology grows and is adopted is really vital uh, for your career. So um, keep that in mind. Make sure that you look at the presentation uh, that I was uh, honored to be able to be asked to uh, produce uh, about innovation and standardization to the inevitable commoditization. Um, we don't, you know, we, we, we don't look for certain things to evolve um, and then stay that standard forever. Um, sooner or later, something new comes along that's faster, cheaper, more efficient, uh, more extensible, those sorts of things, and we go from there. So let's jump in in a couple of things that are just uh, uh, additional to the presentation on uh, uh, in the module for this week. Um, different types of standards. Um, there's technology reference models. There's guidelines for cloud uh, adoption or cloud management, uh, different kinds of reference patterns, IT principles in terms of storage and replication and security and risk management, etc. Logical date, data uh, models, if you're in the database world, you'll know what a structured database, what an unstructured database, how field mapping works from platform to platform, etc. So these are all things that help um, reduce the sort of one-off feeling uh, for every product that you add to your infrastructure. Can we add some things that are similar, that act in similar ways, that require less training because they act in ways that we uh, expect them to? Um, standards are IT focused and their rules. They become uh, EA uh, artifacts, whether they're Wi-Fi specs or um, internet traffic or IP addressing or a variety of different things, and they all work in that way. Um, they usually have with them a lifespan, and um, you know, they're reviewed, they're updated. Uh, sometimes the USB group will 
you now come out with a, a new USB standard 3.0 and 4.0 and different interconnects reflected of them. We now have a C connector that incidentally the European um, Union, the European Commission basically mandated that Apple get rid of its proprietary um, interconnects and interfaces and use a USB-C um, standard for, um, uh, for all of its products in the European Union. So finally, you can connect your iPad to an external storage device, uh, which will be revolutionary and uh, a lot of other things. So nature abhors proprietary systems and um, the move is ever toward greater and greater standardization. So um, as part of the annual review process for an information technology architect or designer, you're going to say, um, look, what, what are the standards that we should keep for the next year, the next three to five years? When will they develop into something else? When is something at risk of becoming not only commoditized, but no longer supported as an inter interface or things like that? Um, and so it's really important to just keep abreast of those changes. Standards um, are not, you know, the, the only thing in town. Um, and sometimes standards can become overly strict and inflexible. In other words, unless you build with this 10-year-old technology, you can't sell to these companies or something like that. And that, that happens sometimes. So, um, you know, the, the Thunderbird interface for, uh, uh, for Apple is probably another uh, one that uh, comes to mind. So standards is a balancing act between what's standardization, what's innovation, where do we need to be flexible, where is it part of our DNA that helps us competitively to do things differently? Uh, and then where do we not, you know, we're, we're not going to build our uniqueness about some unique USB magic mojo that we come up with. No, we're going to use USB standards because you know what? They're all out there and they're all the same. And that's the way um, the industry has figured out that there's some things that everyone does and then there's some things that individual companies do to distinguish them uh, themselves. So that hierarchy of standards is important. Um, any irrelevant standards that get in the way uh, should be removed promptly. There's no religion that says you have to follow all the standards. Um, and so reasonable deviations should be tolerated and um, and they should be analyzed. All these standards have a life cycle where they become new, they become adopted, they drive business, and then slowly they become uh, locked and, and fixed and you know, encased in concrete. And other things come along that make it important to, uh, to migrate. So let's continue here. Um, these are global technology rules. They're developed collaboratively. Sometimes it's important for you or your company to be a part of these standards, especially if it's a standard like, I don't know, Wi-Fi or, or something like that that really affects your, uh, your networking company. You make Wi-Fi routers and, and access points and things like that. And you need to know when the next, you know, um, 802.11 standard Z or Z plus or whatever it is, the next one that comes out is coming and then how to change your equipment so that when those standards become adopted publicly, you have equipment ready to, uh, you know, ready to go in, in, uh, in, in that area. So just another um, thing that's important to keep in mind. Um, you have a bigger question when you look at standards. How do you know that a technology, first of all, is going to is going to catch on. Something's introduced, and wow, this seems like it's really great. We have this need to perform this particular IT function. Maybe it's networking, maybe it's security or encryption or you know, whatever. When do we know it's time to jump on board with this technology? In other words, we don't want to buy, the, we don't want to be the first one to buy it because it's always three or four times as expensive. Uh, companies make up their R&D um, expenses with the 1.0 versions of a lot of software and hardware, as most people um, begin to realize. But when is the right time to jump in? So you get a long life of using this product, 
and yet you don't and so you don't have to change you know six months later when it's you know goes out of business or no longer the standard or anything like that and when is it our time to adopt these new technologies into our IT solutions architecture these are super important questions and a lot of people don't really know. I don't know. I talk to people, uh, you know, listen to the boss or, or whatever, but soon you'll be the boss. How do you know these things? It's more than just surfing the internet or, or, or looking at, at, at concepts. How do we know how much of this is common, etc.? cetera? Uh, two things that I'd like to introduce um, as you get to make educated guesses or analyses about market adoption of new technologies. There's a, a barometer that's published by the Gartner organization called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And they have a acceptance pattern metaphor that they use for any particular technology, whether it's networking, software, um, business practices, uh, you know, virtual reality goggles, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of different technologies, they have a particular acceptance um, development uh, metaphor called the hype cycle. And um, there's another, if, if you really like the subject here, in marketing in particular, I would recommend um, probably the most important book you'll read that's not assigned in this uh in the ICT program is the book by Joffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm. It is um, how you uh, are tracking uh, the adoption patterns of new technology. How do you market? How do you sell prof, uh, products into mainstream customers who are going to need to change from, you know, say Windows 10 to Windows 11? And why would they make that move? And how, if you're selling something that is um, going to service the Windows 11 market, how do you understand when is it time to introduce your products? Those are really important. So, Gardner Hype Cycle and Crossing the Chasm. We'll look briefly at both of them for just a second. The Hype Cycle uh, on the left is a conceptual uh, diagram. Um, some trigger, some introduction, some new. Um, thing or process or product or whatever is introduced and you have this peak of inflated expectations these are the marketing the results of marketing and advertising of these new products into the user bases that's ah, the greatest thing since sliced bread it'll do this it'll do that and everyone's excited and think wow you know it's it's the greatest thing in the world and wow oh, but it's expensive and developing it and it, you know it doesn't work with everything and you have to you know, if, if you buy a PlayStation 5, um, you know, your PlayStation 3 games, you know, aren't going to work and you're going to have to have a, a, a conversion module for your uh, PlayStation 4 and it's really, you know, expensive. And so when do you get in there? So you have after that a trough of disillusionment. Oh, my God, this is going to take work. And then finally, uh, with time, you, you this is a, you know, visibility, maturity uh, axes here. Um, this what's called the slope of enlightenment and uh, everything. Okay, we can use this. There's a, a upgrade path. There are all these third party products that are now being made. This is really the time to adopt. And then finally, the plateau of productivity. In other words, we've reached as far as this is going to go. We maintain this until some other technology trigger comes down the road. Um, this is an older chart from 2019. If you want the most current charts, you got to pay a lot of money to Gartner for their smarts on this area. But these are just a lot of different um, emerging technologies. In, in this is published for the year 2019. And you look, look at the very top of the inflated expectations. You'll see 5G there. It's 2019 now. A lot of metro areas now have 5G in 2022. So it's predictive in that respect about where these things are. And so you have things like immersive work, uh, immersive workspaces or working from home, pretty low in 2019. After COVID, I would, I would guess it's a little bit higher in terms of the, uh, uh, the slope of enlightenment. Um, so that's Gardner. And the crossing the chasm uh, with Jeffrey Moore is, uh, in fact, 
my organization, the uh, Open Networking Foundation, we had a summit in uh, in, in Silicon Valley uh, for um, software-defined networking and and how it was crossing the cap uh, the chasm in terms of adoption. You have early markets with visionaries, early adopters, innovators, etc. Um, and it's yeah, you know, it's it's a cross between brilliance and maybe science fair. It's not ready for prime time. But then when you start seeing the early majority, you you've got uh, sigma distributions from the median here, and so you have the early majority and the late majority. These are the people who the you know the pragmatists say, okay, it, it's ready and we can go and we can start deploying this. The conservatives after you know, that are later to the game will say, okay, hang on. And then you get to a point where it's so late that only the skeptics, skeptics have adopted this finally. And other people are looking to see what the next trigger is going to be. Um, the Crossing the Cavern, uh, the Chasm Cavern, <laughs> uh, is a great book. I, it, I think it just went into its fourth edition. Timeless uh, in 30 years of watching these activities. It's timeless uh, wisdom in that sense. Okay, so let's move finally to the week eight, um, part four of the Arch Insurance case study. This too is one of those additional papers that you're going to fold in to the uh, the overall uh, five point um, um, final uh, report. And uh, so all the happy stuff about using the template, updating table of contents, all those sorts of things, keep those things in mind. This is about privacy and governance. Um, in many ways, it's about standards and standards for data privacy, data sovereignty, et cetera. So you'll be reading information on this. We've decided to give you, uh, take the assignment and say, we're gonna have some stuff that's new information. We'll keep that in green. And then as we talk about, um, previously how to chunk this into exact deliverables, we've uh, identified those in yellow. So these are um, things that Arch Insurance has decided. It is going to expand, yay you. Um, it's gonna target the EU, Australia, uh, Japan, China, India, as well as its existing North American markets. So wow, that's staff and organizations and technology, et cetera. Arch Insurance also, I'm just summarizing, wants to outsource its claims processing function, and it's giving all of that to a company based in Australia. So three companies that have merged are now going to hand this off to another, uh, to another organization better equipped to handle insurance transaction processing. Um, as, as important as that, Arch Insurance is, is now saying we are going to go to the cloud. Cloud first, cloud always, as much as possible. And we're looking for cloud-based applications. We have to find cloud services so that we leverage information as a service. And um, we're going to do cloud business. Think about it. The EU, Australia, Japan, China, India, as well as North America. So we have to be compliant with all the regulatory regimes in those spaces. So that's California CCPA, which really you should do in terms of any place in the United States, uh, just to, to keep yourself, you know, they don't sell um, California catalytic converters and California pollution control devices. They sell cars with that standard and that's kind of in the US market and that's that's kind of how it works. Um, but with uh, the European Union general directives for data protection, um, GDPR is becoming adopted not only in the EU, but uh, Japan, China, and India have a form or a variant of that. There are also data sovereignty limits where you, you know, if you, if you live in India, you can't have your data um, hosted in Beijing or in, you know, Seattle or something like that. So uh, that sovereignty is important. So those are the big decisions uh, that are in green. So now your job is to write a report on that. Um, uh, how are we going to the cloud? How are we going to be secure in the cloud? What do we have one cloud to rule them all? Um, 
that may not even be possible in terms of China. And so how do we how, how do we measure this? Do we have local cloud providers? What's the standard between something with a, a, a global scope and yet something that's flexible for individual rules? Uh, China will be one of the, uh, the areas that you'll need to pay attention to there. So you've been asked by the board um, to explain the impacts of regulation on all these plans, all this stuff in green. And how do we address the risks, uh, particularly with outsourcing, the move to cloud, um, that the current planning presents. This is huge. So it's an independent paper, but again, you're going to fold this into the, um, the summative uh, uh, assignment for week 10. Uh, 2,000 to 2,500 words in length. Again, you call uh, format and style requirements and uh, keep that in mind. And also, the rubric is your friend. So you're going to have... Um, meeting the purpose of the assignment, the impacts of regulation on this, how do you recommend to respond to these risks, um, develop those as an idea, your conclusions, how do we do this? How do you put the information that you've learned this week into this paper? And then the grammar, mechanics, and style, those are all the things that are important. So finally, have a great week, everybody. Work hard, and uh, looking forward to seeing your progress. Bye-bye now.